This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Support for MPB comes from Trustmark, a financial partner for businesses throughout the South for 130 years. Trustmark offers a range of products and services designed to help small businesses efficiently manage finances. More info at Trustmark.com, member FDIC. Radio, this is Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. Nancy and Ryder are both chartered financial analysts, and Ryder also holds their certificate in investment performance measurement from the CFA Institute. Americans talk about the S&P 500, but what is it? We hear about it on the news, but can you buy it or touch it? Money Talks strives to be a place where you can ask questions and learn about financial terms. Our experts donate their time and knowledge with the goal to help you improve your personal finances. Contact us by email. Our address is money at mpbonline.org. So good morning, Nancy. Let's start with you with some financial news to share. Good morning. Well, volatility is back on the table, and the VIX, which is the uh, index which measures volatility, has been going up. And we're seeing that today with a big decline on markets today. We saw that last week. It gained back on Friday. So I think this is just what we're living with right now. We don't always know what causes that from one day to the next. We're still looking at the longer term and how our economy is doing. But um, interestingly enough, along with that, oil is dropping dramatically and it's now below $37 a barrel. Uh, When the price of oil fluctuates like that, is there a correlation to us seeing lower prices at the gas pump any time in the near future? Well, loosely. Uh, And it depends on how long it stays down, uh, whether that really filters down to what you see when you gas up your car. So we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, Good morning, Ryder. What do you have uh, for financial news in the news? Good morning. I think actually some of the most interesting financial news is actually very pertinent to our topic. So I don't know if I want to, if if I'm going to overstep some things we're planning on talking about later, but the S&P 500, uh, which is uh, one of the you know, most major indexes that folks talk about, that people track, that you probably always hear quoted on the radio. Uh, they added some. Uh, they added three stocks and dropped three stocks from them. So, you know, kind of good news. You know, great for those uh, companies uh, that have been um, admitted to the index. That indicates that they are uh, both profitable and have been growing enough to to meet the size threshold uh, to kind of join that club. And that means there'll be a a much broader um, a much broader ownership uh, uh, folks available to buy it. And uh, and then, of course, to if it is the SP 500, they try to keep a strict number. Although, Nancy, how many are in there? 501, 502? It um, is now 505. At 505? This is nonsense, Nancy. They dropped three. <laughs> yes. I, I, this is unacceptable. I, you know, I'm going to have to write a strongly worded letter to, the, to, to Mr. Standard and Mr. Poor. <laughs> this, is, this is unacceptable. Um, yeah, so there's, so three three new stocks came in and three dropped out, but um, but I think we'll probably also talk about uh, some of those details a little bit later. But that's really interesting. Uh, for European soccer fans, uh, three three stocks have been relegated and three have been promoted. So ah, uh, there you go. Yes, uh, we're looking for your personal finance questions this morning as we do talk about the S and P 500, what it is and how it works. Uh, so you can give us a call if you have a question. The number is one eight seven seven. MPB Ring. It's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. So, Nancy, what is the S and P five hundred? Um, it is what I would call a measuring stick, and it's an index of large U.S. companies. And so, for that reason, it doesn't represent everything that's happening in the market. Um, because it is just the biggest U.S. companies that's in that mix. And it's just a way of tracking the performance of the overall market. And for investors, it's a way to track your own portfolio performance by looking at, well, what did the S&P 500 do? And how does that compare to my own portfolio? But you also have to consider it is all stocks. So, you know, if you're not all stocks, you're not going to track that exactly. But again, just a way to measure performance. And as Ryder mentioned, it's Standard and Poor's. Um, Are those people or how did the S&P get named? So this Hmm. is one of my favorite little facts. One of those people 
One of those is a person. Um, do y'all want to? Do we want to have this as our question over our first break? <laughs> well, who, which one is the person? Um, we can do that. It, was, <laughs> it came from the, the the merger of two companies the form standard and pours but one of them was indeed named after a person uh henry varnum poor uh was the poor of s&p 500 and the other one was just standard statistics bureau which uh boy if you are if you are hard pressed to come up with a name for your uh your company standard statistics bureau i guess that's what you come up with and i'm hoping that's poor like pour a glass of water and not poor like i have no money poor Oh, it's it's poor. Like I have no money for. And now I, you know, I'm, I don't know that this gentleman was uh, lacking in funds himself. But uh, but yeah, that is, his last name was Poor. P O O R. Uh, it looks like we have a caller on the line, so we'll say good morning to uh, Sue in Beaumont. Good morning, Sue. You're on the air. Good morning. This is not anything about standard and boards or anything like that. I'd like to ask a question about what backs up U.S. currency, because I found out several years ago, I was talking to a professor at USM, and he said that um, I always thought, you know, that the gold in Fort Knox backed up our currency, but that's not true. So what's that gold doing sitting there in Fort Knox? And then it's not covered by it's not covered by silver certificates or anything like that. We only have the promise of what the United States Treasury says money is worth before they print, they print it out and say we'll redeem it for such and such. What does back our U.S. currency? Well, it is the strength and stability of the U.S. economy. That's it. Oh dear, uh, we have exactly. <laughs> um, we have, and remember that the U.S. economy is the largest economy on the globe. Um, it is very stable. Um, our currency is often used in commodity purchases. Um, so it is a valued currency. But for now, it's just about you know how stable are we, how strong are we economically, how good is our legislative system, our set of regulations that regulates our markets. All of that goes into it. Um, we have long ago given up on the gold standard. There for a while we had sort of a mixed bag with still gradually moving off the gold standard, but really it's not attached to gold at all. So what is, what, yeah. the, what, why is the gold kept in Fort Knox then? Why, why is that if it's not backing our currency or what? Well, and I'm not sure how much is kept in uh, Fort Knox. I believe the Federal Reserve Bank of New York also keeps a stash as well. Um, I'm not really sure what the purpose is. Ryder, do you know? Well, I mean, where else are they going to keep it? <laughs> I mean, they, they have all this gold. I mean, it's, you know, it, the gold isn't isn't worthless. Um, and, I mean, obviously it used to be used for maintaining, you know, trade balances, things like that. Um, but... I mean, it's not like they just decided to. Well, you know, we're not going to use this for trade. Let's just let's just go give it away. Um, no, I, I don't know if there's any any other purpose for it, though. Well, okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for the call, Sue. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I yeah. uh, graciously will offer my spare room in my house for gold storage uh, anytime the government oh, needs a, needs a space for it. Thank so. you. Thank you for your service, Kevin. <laughs> And, and I believe the phrase that is used for, you know, what backs our currency is the – it is the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. All right. So that's where that phrase and, comes and from. And, Kevin, I would point out uh, – if you think about a bar of gold, what intrinsic value does it really have? Very little that you can use the gold for. It has you can value use it because in we believe it has value. What's Not, that? A whole brick, though? He's, uh, you can use it in dentistry. Oh well, you, need a, a, a you know, small gold filling purpose. That would be fun to see a, a um, vending machine that accepts gold ingots. That would be kind of fun. For I the, think there are there are some. <laughs> must be for the very rich. Absolutely. Uh, let's get back uh, before our first break a, couple, a bit more about uh, the Standard & Poor's. Uh, Ryder, what companies are included in the S and P 500? And I would imagine there would be a lot of names that we would recognize. Would you like me to go down an exhaustive list, or do you just want me to hit the highlights? I mean, well, I've, I've got the list right here. Um, so obviously, some of the, all of the, it is generally speaking, it is the 500 largest companies 
uh, publicly traded companies in the U.S. And you know, there's something like is it around four to six thousand publicly traded companies in the U.S. Most people are probably not familiar with most of them, but of course, the bigger ones you probably have more interaction with. And and so at the top, um, you know, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, um, the big ones like that. Uh, Visa and Walmart, uh, you know, a lot of the larger national banks, even uh, plenty of, you know, kind of larger regional banks will be on there. Um, but down on the small end, there may even be some that folks recognize on the small end. Uh, right now, uh, hanging in there, uh, Norwegian Cruise Line Holdings is still in the S&P 500. Um, you know, they, even though they suffered a lot, they're still very large companies. Um, large transportation companies obviously the large uh, the airlines are all going to be big enough um large telecommunications at&t verizon uh, a lot of the major companies that you deal with on a daily basis are uh are going to be in the s&p 500 we'll continue our discussion about the s&p 500 after this break you're listening to money talks on mpb think radio presented on Money Talks is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information presented does not create any type of relationship between the hosts and guests and the listening audience. Please consult a financial advisor or any other qualified professional for guidance about your personal finance questions. I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. This is Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. The Money Talks website, moneytalks.mpbonline.org, is one place to hear past Money Talks broadcasts. You can also download the MPB Public Media app, and then you'll be able to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand to all of the MPB Think Radio shows. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lottridge-Anderson, President of New Perspectives and Ryder Taft Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives. We're looking for your personal finance questions at one 877 MPB Ring. It's one 672 7464 Send an email to money at mpbonline.org. Also this morning, we're talking about the S&P 500, although in the first part of the show we learned it's actually the S&P 505 at this current uh, time. Uh, so, Ryder, we did, you did mention that recently uh, there's been some, uh, re, uh, some jiggling, I guess, of who's in the uh, S&P 500. Uh, how frequently do those changes occur? Uh, so it is determined by com they have some rules. Obviously, it has to be one of the 500 largest. Uh, some profitability rules, things like that. Uh, but it is ultimately determined by committee. Uh, they meet, I believe, quarterly, um, and will often change just a, a couple. Uh, but they can meet without making any changes. And sometimes, I mean, I, I think adding and dropping three this time was kind of a kind of a, a, a lot uh, they usually just do one or two um, but you know kind of anything is 
anything is in the cards, especially when we've had such a, a wild ride this year. Um, and you said that you had the list. So are, do people know all of the companies in the S&P 500, who they are? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, and it, it is kind of, to some extent, valuable information, but, but of course it is also very widely, widely used. There's a lot of places you can go look. Um, but one one important use of them is that uh, a lot of a lot of index funds will track the S and P 500, and so you know whoever is managing those funds needs to know exactly who is in there at all times. Of course, you know doesn't change for once a quarter, um, but you know they need to know that for for all of their you know trading and you know accumulating and you know buying and selling shares uh, etc and also folks who do participate in the market they care whether or not a company is in the S&P 500 because it being in that index and it being owned by those uh, those index funds or it being um, kind of followed by pretty much any you know any fund manager who tracks large companies kind of needs to have their eye on companies in the S&P 500 so even if you're not that concerned with the S&P 500 you do want to know uh, if your company, if the company you're looking at, if the company you're buying or selling is in there, because the dynamics of those people who own it will affect the company, uh, and so it's just it's valuable information. So you mentioned tracking the fund. What, what does that mean exactly? That if you had that index fund, you would you would have companies only in the 500, and it would be prorated as the the top funds would have the top companies would have more. What does tracking mean in that instance? Exactly. Yes. So, uh, and, and we talk about this a lot. We talk about index funds. So the S&P 500 is an index. You cannot buy a share of an index because the index is, is literally, it's just a list. You know, you can write it down on a piece of paper, you can download it in a spreadsheet, but you can't, you can't buy that. Um, so there are funds which buy all of the shares, uh, which buy all of the companies and in the, in the weights that they are in the, in the index. And they're weighted by, essentially, if you have a larger company, you have a larger weight. And that's just determined by your market cap. Uh, that's, you know, however many shares you have uh, multiplied by the price per share. So, for instance, uh, let me just pull this back up. Apple is a over $2 trillion market cap. Uh, so it's got the largest weight um, and about half its size, a little less than half its size. Facebook is $800 billion. Um, and then they go all the way down. Some of the smallest ones are hanging out around in the three, four billion dollar market cap. So those are obviously much, 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 much smaller weight. Um, but those index funds, they just buy all the companies in the appropriate weights and just hold them. And uh, when when the S and P committee makes changes, they make those changes in the fund. So you will ideally you will get very close to that performance if you buy that index fund you will be tracking the performance of that index. So, Nancy, what does the uh, S&P 500 measure? Well, it just measures the uh, growth of that group of stocks, uh, basically their performance, and really gives you an idea of how the overall market is performing. Um, again, it is just large companies, and it does not reflect what's happening in medium-sized companies, smaller companies, international companies, just U.S. large companies. And uh, um, Ryder talked a little bit about the market cap. Um, how, is, how is the value of, of the S&P 500 stocks calculated? Well, cap stands for capitalization. And as Ryder mentioned, the market cap is simply calculated by taking the number of shares outstanding times the current share price. And that just gives you an indication of the overall value of a company. Now, recognize that the number of shares outstanding doesn't change very often, but their share price changes all the time. And so companies that um, whose share price is going up, then their market cap naturally goes up. And that's why you hear, as, as Ryder mentioned, Apple's market cap uh, being reported on the news. Bear in mind that the S&P 500 was first um, – came about in 1957. So companies like Apple and Facebook and Google did not even exist at that time. And that's why you have these changes to better reflect our overall market. So again, we're just looking at the market performance overall. 
This is Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Looks like we have a caller on the line. So let's say good morning to I'm Justin in, uh, and I think I might have. There we go. Justin, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. Okay. I got a question for you. Tesla's worth about $50 billion, and they got snubbed by the S&P 500. Would y'all like to explain why that is? Uh, yeah, I'll take that one. I was actually looking at that uh, earlier. And that's very interesting. So Tesla, and I'm just a, a little correction, Tesla is worth almost $400 billion right now. They've declined a little bit. Uh, they would be one of the largest companies. I believe uh, they might be in the top, they'd be in the top 10 or top 20 largest companies in the S&P 500 if they were in it. Um, now, the... Uh, S&P Corporation, the committee, did not say why they did not include it. Um, it generally does appear to meet their criteria, which is essentially you have uh, you're large enough to be in the index, and and even a, even you know significant declines or volatility would you would still be in there because uh, they don't want a company just dropping out. Um, and also, I believe four quarters of profitability. Uh, and generally, you know, they say, oh, kind of representative of one of the 500 largest companies. I do not know why they did not include it. They have met those bare criteria, and they have absolutely exceeded the market cap one. Uh, they may have concerns about the quality of, the, of Tesla's earnings, uh, and they may just have concerns about how much Tesla has run up um, and how much um, – you know, how much is actually available to put in the index, uh, you know, it, uh, for, for the, all of the index funds tracking it, uh, because that's a bit of a newer concern for the S&P committee is that now there are there's so much money that is simply tracking the S&P 500. Um, adding or dropping a company has so much more of an impact in the market than it used to be. Uh, so I don't know if they're taking any trading concerns uh, into account, but again, they didn't say, and there's maybe a couple of reasons, but I, I, I cannot be, it's all speculation for me. I would also say that they are very conscious of having an index that represents um, a variety of industries. And so for that reason, if there's a company that's already in the index that really would be the spot Tesla would occupy, that that may be why they have not uh, been included. They're worth more than Toyota. Yeah, they, they are. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's an interesting choice not to put them in, and I, and I do not know. Um, but I, I, sus I suspect, I kind of as you pointed out, that run-up in value um, is a little. Uh, that could be, that could be one of their concerns. Um, the volatility that it would add to the index that could be one of their concerns. Um, it is in other indices, um, and there is a, a kind of a lower cost index uh, called the Bloomberg 500, which it is included in, uh, and I believe they're in the Nasdaq index as well. Um, so it's not like they are not represented in finance at all so that's a great that's a that's a really great question and i i would love to see some uh, some more discussion about that all right uh, justin thanks for calling this is money talks on mpb think radio uh Ryder, talk to us about assigning weights for the companies in the s p 500 yeah so again the, the committee doesn't really assign weights so much as they just say bigger companies are bigger um, so again, going back to what we were saying about market capitalization, again, that is just the dollar value of the company in the market. Um, so, you know, say you have two different companies and one of them, their share price is $50 and one of them, their share price is $10. Well, and if the $50 company has two shares outstanding, then they are worth $100. And if the $10 uh, company has 20 shares outstanding, they are worth $200. So that $200 would be twice the weight of the $100. Uh, so it's, it's very simple. They just say, who, the, where, where, where is the more money? The more money is the bigger one, and the less money is the smaller one. And they just do it proportionally for the capitalization of each company. So they're not determining weight. The market does that. 
We'll continue our discussion of the S&P 500 in just a bit. You're listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Walker, the lady auto mechanic, host of AutoCorrect. If you're enjoying this podcast, try my podcast, AutoCorrect. We help steer you in the right direction with your car problems. Find me on any podcast platform or at autocorrect.mpbonline.org. Hi, it's Rachel Martin with NPR's Morning Edition. People have stories about their car, that long summertime family road trip, that hand-me-down first car they got when they turned 16, the first car they bought on their own. And cars can generate other kinds of stories, like the kind you hear on this station. When you donate a vehicle to this station, the proceeds bring you stories from around the world. Here's how to get started. Donate your car, motorcycle, boat, or RV by going to mpbonline.org. Money Talks is MPB Think Radio's personal financial broadcast. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson, President of New Perspectives and Ryder Taft Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives. Nancy and Ryder are both chartered financial analysts. Ryder holds the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. We are looking for your personal finance questions this morning, as we do each Tuesday. Also, we're talking about the S&P 500, although I'm going to rename it the 505 because there are that uh, additional companies in there, and I think that's kind of a catchy, uh, a catchy way to say it. So we're talking about the 505, although I think that might be a highway in California also, but who knows. Um, Probably. Nancy, uh, how do they determine the number that the S&P 500 closes at each day? Well, it's a simple matter of looking at the closing price of each of those stocks that are in the S&P 500 or the 505 and just doing the math then to look at the cumulative value of the S&P 500. And our producer, Liz Gill, reminds me the 505s are Levi's. They uh, may be Buttonfly, not sure. but uh, uh, Yes, I remember that now. I knew it sounded too catchy to not have been taken by. And I wonder if Levi's is in the 500. Did, uh, Ryder, do you know? We need to check that out. Uh, I am not sure. I could look that up, though. All right. Uh, so, uh, Nancy, when he checks on that for us, we, we talked about this earlier. You really can't buy a piece of the S&P 500, but you can get those funds that sort of track the, the index. There are a lot of index funds out there. And one caution when I talk to people who have an index fund, remember – if it's an index fund, find out which index it's tracking. And the S&P 500 is a popular index to track. And if they're all buying the same stocks in the S&P 500, the real trick for the investor is to purchase the index fund with the lowest fees because that's going to reduce your overall returns. They're just tracking that market. It's what we call passive investing. You're not trying to figure out if um, you should buy that Tesla share of Tesla or the share of Apple. You're just tracking everything in that index. Uh, can you mention some of the funds that do track uh, the S&P 500? Well, um, Vanguard 500 is one of the famous S&P 500 uh, index mutual funds out there. We see that a lot. It's in a lot of retirement plans. And um, we also have some ETFs, exchange-traded funds, that track the S&P 500. In fact, ETFs are pretty new, came into being in the 90s, and the first ETF tracked the S&P 500. Uh, remind us of what an ETF is. 
Uh, an ETF is like a mutual fund. It's a collection of securities. It can be a collection of stocks or a collection of bonds or a combination of things. And um, with ETFs, even though they are like a mutual fund, they trade a little bit differently than what we call an opened-end mutual fund. They trade like stocks. They trade all during the day. The price changes all during the day. They are handled a little bit differently. The mechanics are a little different, so they're more tax efficient. With a old line mutual fund like the Vanguard 500, when you place a trade to purchase those shares, you have to wait until you get to the end of the day, and they do all the calculations to determine share price, and then overnight, that's when your trade clears. So, Ryder, have you been able to see if uh, Levi's is in the S&P 500? So Levi's is not in the S and P 500. It is. Um, it, it isn't. It isn't too small to be in the index, but it's too small to be added to the index at this point. So I. I, I don't know what its history is if, if it was dropped out at some point. Um, and again, just sort of looking in, and broadly at it, are there? Types of companies that are more heavily represented than others, say, you know, car manufacturers, clothing stores, banks, that sort of thing. Can you give us maybe a sense for what comprises the 500? Uh, kind of. So you, right now, and again, because they are market cap weighted, whatever is kind of the biggest and most this segment that's had the most growth lately is going to be a little overrepresented. But for instance, the technology and healthcare companies are a very big part of it. Um, formerly financial companies used to be a very, very big part of it, but those have kind of kind of stagnated for a long time, so they haven't really kept up. And uh, one, uh, you know, kind of segments that have really declined a lot, energy, uh, basic materials, utilities, those have all declined a lot. Obviously, with the declining price in oil, um, those are just, just not nearly as big of a part as they used to be. Uh, what's the average return on the S&P 500, Ryder? Um, so, historically, we... Uh, say kind of maybe around 10 percent annually uh, i don't know what that is right now uh, they've had a uh, this year has been an interesting year but um last month was actually one of the best months on record for the s p 500 i think it returned a little over seven percent uh which was the most um in since sometime in the 80s i believe and uh, does it always close up every year no, no, it can it can definitely go down. Um, for instance, 2008, uh, the S and P 500 had a precipitous decline. I'm not sure exactly what the percentage was. I want to say around 40 percent uh, from the high of the year to uh, the end of the year. Um, so that's a that's a pretty steep decline. Uh, and then since then, you know, it's we've had a couple of flat or down years, but nothing quite so dramatic as that, um, of course, until this year when we had a pretty steep decline from Mar uh, February to March, uh, and we have had quite the rebound from March uh, until, well, really, till the end of August, I believe. And, you know, uh, Nancy earlier talked about volatility, and I think this is, might be a, a time to drop this in, but that's w one thing to keep in mind and why sometimes it's better to have at least part of an eye on long-term uh, performance of, of companies as opposed to things in the short term. Exactly. And it's a lesson for investors that this is not a straight line if you invest in the S&P 500 or if you invest in any stock. Those prices can go down as well as go up. And so many times when we've had several quarters of markets going up, investors get fooled into thinking, well, they always go up. No, they don't. You can have precipitous declines in a very short period of time. As Ryder mentioned, in March, when all of the news hit about the pandemic and the shutdown, we saw huge declines in the market. Now, we have bounced back. So time is really on your side. When it comes to investing in any stocks, you don't need to do it with short-term money. You need to make sure you can put that in anywhere from three to five years and can last any business cycle with those ups and downs. So again, Ryder, you're the guy with the list. Uh, is there anything, uh, kind of again, just doing quickly that kind of surprises you? That's uh, that the company in the 500. 
Um, I mean, I kind of am surprised just by the, those, those top companies, which are so overwhelmingly large. Um, the Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Apple um, combine for $6 trillion worth of market capitalization, and the and that's almost as big as the rest of the entire list. Um, and Microsoft is at, is at 1.6 trillion, and Facebook, which is only two steps below it, is half its size. So I think the surprising thing is really just the weight of those top stocks, and that means that in a, a, for the percentage increase in the share price of Apple, for instance, you know, if Apple increases one percent, then it um, then it has a, a massively outsized impact uh, on the index. Whereas, you know, if one of the smaller companies, say, here's uh, the currently the smallest company is oh boy, nobody's heard. Of this. Please call in if you've heard of this company, Technip SMC PLC. It is oil and gas equipment and services. They're three and a half billion dollars. Uh, they they just do not have the impact that a price move in Apple has. I, I, I used to work for that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, yeah, classic, classic, classic. Yeah. Well, one smaller company that um, folks may recognize, um, Xerox Holdings, uh, it is still hanging out in there. Um, Marathon Oil, uh, you know, there's Marathon gas stations around. They are, you know, an oil refiner. They're still hanging in there. Um, Under Armour. Um, they're in there. They're only four and a half billion dollars, though. So, you know, a price move in Under Armour, you know, they could double, and you know that would be add four and a half billion dollars to the index. Um, whereas Apple, again, that's 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 nothing. That's just nothing to Apple. And like Kevin, he, uh, you can hear from that list, and as Ryder described it, what's really driving things are what we call the fangs. Uh, F-A-N-G-S. And so that stands for Facebook, Amazon, Netflix. The G is the old Google now known as Alphabet. And so those big tech companies are really uh, ruling the day right now in the market. We have an email and we'll continue talking about the S&P 500 after this break. You're listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Grayson. You can now listen to the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi with Mile Marker. We are a uh, Yucca Drive In Theater. We're the last operating drive in in the state of Mississippi. Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. Freak me out that you could come and drive your car and park and watch the movie outside. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org slash radio or by using your favorite podcasting app, Mile Marker, a Mississippi Roads podcast. Listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotter Janderson, President of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taff, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives. All right, here is an email that's a little bit uh, involved, but I think we might be able to wade through it. And it says, I have the option before October 31st to, quote, adjust my federal tax withholding amount for my lump sum payment. End quote. I have no idea what to do. When I signed my retirement plan, I had no idea what I was doing, and I could tell the young man assisting me also had no clue what to ask. The statement reads, quote, at retirement, you selected to receive annually on December 15th a COLA benefit. 
Can someone explain to me in a fourth grade level what is the best way to, quote, adjust your federal tax withholding amount for your lump sum payment dated for December? The form reads uh, that I will receive a COLA adjustment for 2020, and then there's a federal tax withholding, which I am told I elected for your monthly PERS retirement benefits. Is what I selected elected to receive reversible after the fact, or is my ignorance my legacy to the grave? Where could I have gone for clear, fair insight to research on what I should have selected at retirement? Nancy, we'll give you first stab at that. Again, kind of involved, but any thoughts uh, off the top of your head? Well, this sounds like, um, again, this is a state employee. They're receiving PERS. One of the huge advantages with the PERS system is the cost of living adjustment. And a lot of people elect to receive that as a one-time or a lump sum payment at the end of the year versus having it added to your monthly payments. And I think what you're running into with this situation is because you get this large lump sum payment and your withholdings are set up already for your monthly payments, that the system may recognize that big lump sum just like it would a lump, uh, excuse me, a monthly payment so that there's a large amount taken out for taxes rather than understanding that that represents the annual amount. Um, So you might want to just check with your CPA because you need to look at your total income that you're receiving in retirement to see how that fits and what percentage you should have withheld for federal taxes. Uh, Ryder, any additional thoughts on, on this email? All right. Uh, We actually have a caller on the line, so let's say uh, good morning to Charlene, who's called in today. Charlene, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. My question is, we're told to save money for the future, that the dollar will soon be worthless. What is the best way to save money? What form, type, and uh, where to put it? Well, Charlene, first I'm going to say do not be afraid of the dollar uh, losing value, as you describe. Um, We may be facing at some point way in the future where the U.S. currency is may not be the prime currency because we have other company, uh, excuse me, other countries that are rising economies and are asking for their currencies to be considered in transactions. But don't worry about the dollar. We're still strong. Uh, fundamentally, we're great, and, and it's a good situation. Now, where to save money? You need to consider what are your needs in the future. And again, if it's short-term money and you think, I'm going to need to buy a car shortly or I'm going to purchase a house this year, then you need to keep it very safe. Even though our interest rates are very low, go to the bank, look at savings rates, um, look at CDs. Don't invest your short-term money in the stock market. If you're looking at longer-term money, and certainly any retirement is going to be longer-term, then consider stocks as part of your portfolio because those good, strong U.S. companies that pay dividends are some of the best hedges against inflation. And so they're great places to put your money for the long term. All right, Charlene, we appreciate your call. This is Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. We've been talking today about the S&P 500, now the 505. Uh, Nancy, another one that pe- people might have heard about is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, if you could compare and contrast that with the S&P 500. Well, the Dow is probably the one that's quoted on the news every night that people think about first when they think about the market. The problem is that index is not a very good index. We've been talking all show about the S&P 500 being limited to 505 big U.S. companies. The Dell only represents 30 companies, just 30. And so it's not a good representation of the overall market. It was created in 1896 by Charles Dow, who worked with his associate um, Edward Jones to create the Dow Jones. And it is a price-weighted index, whereas we've been talking about the S&P 500 being weighted based on the size of the company. The Dow is weighted based on the price per share, and it has been adjusted through the years, but that is not a good way to weight an index. So it's a very imperfect index, and we usually see it at the top of the news hour, and most investors don't even look at that. We go straight to the S&P 500 and broader market indexes beyond that. So was the Dow more useful 
earlier in time and it's just maybe no i don't think it was more useful i think it was one of those that was created on the fly um and remember this is 1896 we were just getting going with our stock market and uh and there was a recognition of we needed to have something to measure how this thing was growing and so this was just thrown together even though they did use a statistician um it is not a good index for most investors all right so Ryder, we've talked about how the uh, s p 500 represents the big companies uh, is there an index out there for smaller companies absolutely there are a, a bunch of smaller ones um and i will say s p uh manages a couple of them themselves they have the I believe the S&P 400 for mid-cap stocks and um, S&P small cap 600 for uh, small cap stocks. And so kind of, I, I don't know, I believe the numbers, if you thought the, the 505 was a weird number to have in S&P 500, I think it gets even weirder with the 400 and the 600. Um, but those are the two mid-cap and small cap, which measure just, again, smaller companies uh, than the S&P 500. And so we mentioned that it, there was a committee that, that you know, determines the list. It, is, there, is there a company behind the S&P 500? I mean, what, how does it exist? How does it make money or whatever or provide capital to, to be a thing or is it a thing? Yes, the company behind it is S&P Global. Um, and they do a lot of financial information. Uh, they actually is, they do the, the Dow Jones indices as well now, um, and they license out this information. You know, they, they assemble the list and license that out to folks who want to make a product which tracks it. So we mentioned before the first exchange trade fund, um, SPY, uh, it tracks the S&P 500 in they pay S&P for the right to use that list of stocks. Um, and, and so that's how the company exists. Uh, they also do just a lot of other financial market stuff, including you know, ratings of companies, some uh, information, other information and analysis on companies, et cetera. All right, uh, Nancy, we're going to give you the last word. Got about a minute and a half left. Uh, we've talked about these, uh, the, the Dow Jones we mentioned, but the S&P 500, these sorts of funds. Uh, what is the use for an investor to uh, for lists like the S&P 500? That's a great question, Kevin, and um, I think it's a great way for small investors. You know, you're, you're not trying to, to figure out whether you should buy shares of Apple or you should buy shares of Tesla. You're just going to buy into the market, and it's especially good for people in retirement plans to purchase in. It's what we call passive investing, and it's a low-cost way to track the market. And there are a lot of us who believe it's probably the best way in the long run to generate positive returns for your portfolio. All right, and as we wrap up, uh, some good news. Uh, Money Talks has become the second podcast at MPB Think Radio to surpass 100,000 in the downloads. So that's exciting news for us. I say a big thanks to our producer, Liz Gill, but also writer Nancy. We do appreciate uh, the time and effort that you put into this program. You come on every week and give your uh, opinions and that sort of thing. And so we, we obviously there would be no Money Talks without your expertise. So, again, we appreciate your continued support of MPB and particularly this show. Money Talks is a production of MPB Think Radio, funded in part by the generous financial support from you, our listeners. To hear today's show or previous show, you can find it at moneytalks.mpbonline.org. Or listen to the podcast like 100,000 others. Search for Money Talks on your favorite podcasting app. Our show is produced by Liz Gill. So for Dr. Nancy Lottridge Anderson and Ryder Taff, I'm Kevin Farrell. Join us every Tuesday at 9 for Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Support for MPB comes from Trustmark, a financial partner for businesses throughout the South for 130 years. Trustmark offers a range of products and services designed to help small businesses efficiently manage finances. More info at Trustmark.com 